Hello everybody and welcome to the first lesson of our essential guide to Python Pandas Clash Course. In this course, we will learn about the Python data processing library Pandas. All lessons in this course are designed to be a practical guide with real-life examples and coding tasks using the Jupyter Notebook environment. In addition to the notebook, you can also follow the lessons using the course free handbook. You can access and download all the free materials from the course GitHub repo. In this first video lesson, I will walk you through how to use JupyterLab to create and run Jupyter Notebook files. If you're already familiar with JupyterLab, please feel free to jump to the next video. To start using JupyterLab, I assume you already installed the Python Anaconda data science distribution. I have created a new folder to save all our course materials as you can see here. To launch JupyterLab in a Linux Ubuntu, you can right-click and open the folder in the command terminal. In the terminal window, you can type the command JupyterLab and hit enter. Once the JupyterLab environment is opened, you should see all your saved files within this folder in the file browser area. For example, this is our course notebook and other subfolders to keep our image and dataset files. To create a new notebook file, you can click the Python icon in the notebook's launcher section. This process will create an empty notebook file that is ready to run Python commands. On the top of the notebook, you can change the default untitled name to any relevant title. A typical notebook file consists of cells where the user can run Python code and narrative text. So to add more cells to your notebook, you can use the keyboard shortcuts A and B to add new cells above or below the current selected cell. To delete a cell, you can use the keyboard keys DD. In any notebook file, there are two commonly used cell types. First, a code cell, typically used to type and run Python commands. Once you finish typing your code, click Ctrl and Enter to run the cell. Second, a markdown cell, used to write a narrative text such as study notes and bullet points using the markdown markup language. Once you finish typing your notes, click Ctrl and Enter to run the cell. You can also use the keyboard shortcuts M and Y to change a given cell into a markdown or a code cell. So let's insert a new cell by using the shortcut B, and then hit M to change it to a markdown cell, and hit Y to change it back to a code cell. Note that in order to use the keyboard shortcuts to move between the cells, you need to click the mouse outside the cell typing area or use the shortcut escape. So you can see that JupyterLab can give you a lot of flexibility to run Python code and write supporting text. This is why I use JupyterLab as my favorite tool to work and teach data science topics. In the next videos, you will learn about data processing with Pandas library using our free notebook file, and you will get the chance to practice using Jupyter Notebooks. So keep watching. Hello guys, and welcome to the second video of our Pandas Clash course. All lessons in this course are intended for data professionals and Python developers who wants to learn more about data processing in general, and more specifically the Pandas library. So let's quickly jump to our first lesson on how to import the Pandas library. 
To start using pandas in a notebook file, we will need to import and run the library in a command cell. And just like any other Python library, we can check the library version using the version command. Great, so we can see we have the version 1.2.4. For you guys, you should be able to follow all lessons in this course as long as you have Pandas version 1.0 and above. Okay, so let's move now to the second lecture to describe the anatomy of Pandas data structure. So the Pandas library has two main data structure objects, a data frame object and a series object. The data frame is basically a two-dimensional structure that can hold data in rows and columns. In this example, we see we have a data frame object about country's information, where each row represents a different country. You can think of it as a spreadsheet file or a relational database table. Each column in our data frame is called a series object, which is basically a one-dimensional structure that has a descriptive name and a similar data type for all its values. So in this example, the country name is basically a series object with a text data type, while the population is another series object with a numerical data type. So you can think of a data frame as a group of or collection of different series objects. So later in this course, we will learn that we can create data frames with one or more series objects, or we can actually group multiple series objects into a one data frame. The group of series names are known as labels, while the actual values are data. Next, we talk about the concept of axis. The axis values describe the direction in which any given operation can happen in a pandas object. A data frame is a two-dimensional object, which means it has both horizontal and vertical axes. So let's assume you want to apply a numerical function like the mean or sum. The axis value will allow you to do that either for each column or each row. Both the data frame and series objects has something called index value, which is typically used to access and reference specific data values. And these index values are usually created automatically by the pandas library. However, the end user actually has a lot of tools to manipulate and change them. Later in this course, we will see a lot of practical examples about how we can control and manipulate them and how they can actually be used to slice and dice our data. So I hope this section gave you a good high level understanding of the anatomy and different components of pandas data objects. For the rest of this course, you will get to be more familiar with these concepts and hopefully you will get the chance to practice more data handling and processing using data frame and series objects. So keep watching! Hey guys, and welcome to the third lesson in our Introduction to Pandas Crash Course. In the previous lesson, we learned about the basic commands to import and run pandas library into a notebook file. We also learned about the pandas data structure objects, such as data frame and series. So now we are ready to cover a more advanced topic to learn about how we can get data into and from pandas library. So let us quickly click on our lesson number three. One of the key features that make Pandas such a popular data science tool is the ability to import and export a wide range of data formats. In this diagram, we notice on the left side there are many different types of data formats such as CSV files, Excel sheet, SQL tables, and even HTML data. Each data format has a specific built-in reader function that can convert the data source into a data frame object. Examples of these reader functions include read CSV, read table, and read Excel. Each one of these reader functions has a set of parameters that are designed to handle specific data formats. Once we upload the dataset into a data frame object, we can start a process and analyze the dataset using a variety of built-in tools and functions. After we finish processing the data, 
you will have the option to export the Pandas data frame into different data formats using a set of writer functions, such as to CSV, to Excel, and to SQL. To find a list of all built-in reader and writer functions, click the Pandas Input Output Tool link, which takes you to the relevant Pandas documentation page. So how about we start to write and run some code to learn about some of the most commonly used methods to get data into and from Pandas data frame. We will start with how to make Pandas data frame from Python native data structures. As you guys know, the Python language has a variety of built-in data structures such as lists and dictionaries. These are widely used by Python developers to store data during coding and program execution. However, these tools cannot be effectively used to perform analytical tasks such as exploratory analysis or even data visualization. Luckily, the Pandas library can transfer Python data structure into data frame and series objects to allow users to easily perform data manipulation and analysis. So let's have a look at some examples. We will create a typical Python dictionary to save country information. We create a dictionary with five key values pairs. The dictionary keys represent the labels or titles in the pandas object, while the dictionary values represent the corresponding information of the data. So imagine if we have a large number of dictionaries, each one has information about a different country. The Pandas library can transfer this list of similar dictionaries into a data frame object. So let's have a look at this example. We create a variable called list of countries as a Python list, where each item is a Python dictionary with information about a different country. We then pass this variable as input to the Pandas data frame function, which converts the list into a data frame object called countries. Also notice how we pass the list of countries codes as the index parameter of the data frame object. This is actually an optional parameter, so if we skip this one, the library will automatically create a numerical index value. Finally, we use the head function to display the top rows of our data frame. To have more information about these functions, click the data frame and head functions link in our notebook file to go to the official documentation page. Another approach to transfer a Python dictionary into a data frame object is to use pandas from dictionary built-in function. The dictionary key values represent column names, while the dictionary values are Python lists. Let's have a look at this example. First, we create a dictionary. We then convert the dictionary into a data frame using from dictionary function. So from these examples, we see how the pandas library gave us multiple options to convert Python native data structures into data frame objects. We now move to learn about another method to get data from external data source into Pandas data objects. Tabular data is one of the most commonly used data formats. It's basically presenting the data in the form of tables with rows and columns. So we will learn about how to get data into a Pandas data frame from popular tabular formats such as CSV files, Excel sheets, and SQL tables. We start with importing a CSV file that is shared online on 538 GitHub repo. You can get the dataset exact path by clicking the CSV link in your notebook file. And you can also check other available datasets by clicking the GitHub repo link. The dataset we are reading is about alcohol consumption around the world. So we try to create a data frame object and we apply the pandas read CSV function. We pass the dataset path as input parameter to this function. We then display the top records of this data frame using the head function. 
So we notice here we actually imported the dataset from the cloud. So it's stored online in a GitHub repo and we pass the dataset file location to pandas read CSV function. This function can have many other parameters, such as changing the column name, data type, handling missing values, and many more. To have a look at all possible parameters, you can click the function link, which will take you to the function documentation page. Similar to CSV files, we can also import data from Excel sheet files using pandas read Excel function. In this example, we will use an Excel file that is already stored in our local machine. In my computer here, I save the file in the dataset subfolder as you can see here. So we will create a data frame object and pass the file location to the read Excel function. The read Excel function also has a lot of possible parameters that the user can use, such as getting the data from a specific sheet name. You can learn more about these parameters by clicking the read Excel link, which will take you to the documentation page. Next, we will learn how to import data from a relational database table. To do that, we usually need to establish a connection with a relational database engine, such as Oracle and SQL Server and then we use SQL language to extract specific data. Pandas library provides the read SQL function to pass SQL query syntax and load the result into a data frame object. To simulate this scenario, we will use the Python library SQLite to create a local database file, and then we query the data from this database using the read SQL function. The following code block is not actually part of any pandas command but we just tried to create an external database source with some data stored in it. We first need to import the SQL engine library, it's called SQLite 3. Then we try to make a path where we store the database file. So we will save it in our local subfolder datasets, and we call it a local database example. Then we need to create a connection between our session and the engine file. We start to establish our connection by adding some toy data into a database file. And finally, we save our changes by using the commit command, close the connection, and run the cell. So we don't have any error, which means the code was done successfully. And basically, we created an external database file with a table inside that file called my table and we inserted three different records inside that database. We can see this file if we go to our dataset subfolder and we notice here our local database example file. So now we move to the next step to actually query and extract some data from the external data file and load it into a data frame object. So again, we need to run a list of commands and start by identifying the name and the location of our external database. and we need to start a connection with the database file. And we will create a data frame called people, which we will use to load our query result using the read SQL function.
Finally, we print our data frame object and close the connection with the database engine. So we see here that we successfully query the data from the external database file and reloaded it into a data frame object called people. Another common practice for data professionals and Python developers is to access data from a third party APIs. This approach is useful when the data source is continuously updated, such as weather forecast or the stock market price. API response data usually comes in JSON format, which is a common data format used to exchange data between web applications and servers. In this example, we will use an API called OpenNotify to get information about the International Space Station ISS. The API can give us continuous updates about the ISS current locations and crew members on board. To access this data, we will need to run a few commands to establish the connection between our notebook file and the API before uploading the data into a data frame object. So first we need to import a special library called requests to help us establish a connection. And we also need to import another library called pretty printing to help us to easily read the JSON format. Then we start the connection using the get function and store the response in a response variable. Then we need to convert that response into a JSON format. So let's actually have a look inside this response data to see how it's look like. So we notice now that the response data is basically a dictionary of several key values pairs. And the dictionary tells us there are currently 10 crew members on board the International Space Station. So it's kind of busy up there. This people section gives us a list of dictionaries about the names of all peoples on board. We notice three of them are members of the Shinsu 13, which is, to my understanding, is a Chinese spacecraft that is currently doing a mission with the ISS. This list of dictionaries is very similar to what we learned before about how to convert a list of dictionaries into a pandas data frame. So let's try to do that in this example by creating a data frame called astronauts to store this list of people. Notice how we pass the exact people section of the response data. And this will give us a nice pandas data frame object. Finally, we learned about another method to extract data from web pages. Very often, data professionals need to access external datasets from web pages to add to their analytical projects. For example, let's say you are working on a project and you need a dataset about the population numbers of each country. So you do your research and find this table in a Wikipedia page that has information about each country population and the percentage of change. And you need to quickly get this data as a pandas data frame to start working on it. To do that, you usually need to apply something called web data scraping using specific Python libraries like Beautiful Soup and Selenium. However, the pandas library provides something similar that allows you to quickly do web scraping. So the readHTML is a pandas built-in function that allows you to extract HTML tables from web pages. In this example, we will learn about how we can do that and extract that specific table from Wikipedia page. So the function will take the page URL as a parameter and save the output in a variable called webdata. So we notice that the web data variable is actually a Python list, and if we want to look inside that item in the list, we see it's actually a mix of HTML code. The function read HTML actually searches for any HTML tag that think it could be a data table. 
So in order to find the correct table we need, the data analyst must examine the items inside the list and find what are they actually represent. We already did this examination and noticed the very first item in the list actually contained the HTML table we need. So we will access the web data item 0 and assign it into a variable called web countries table variable. Ok, so you see here the read HTML function successfully extracted this table from the Wikipedia page. Just note here there are some extra character that is already embedded inside this table. So you see here the brackets and parentheses in the table title. And we see the plus and the percentage signs. These extra characters should not actually be part of this data frame. And later in this course, we will learn how to clean the data frame in order to prepare the data for further analysis. So the eatHTML function can give us a very quick way to do data scraping instead of using external Python libraries to extract HTML tables. So far in this lesson, we learned about some very popular and most commonly used methods to, to upload data into Pandas data frame. We started with using native Python data structures to learn how to convert lists and dictionaries into data frame objects. And then we moved to import tabular data formats such as external CSVs and database tables. Then we learned how to access data from a third party APIs using JSON format. And finally we ended with doing data scraping. So all these different options represent the most common ways for the data professionals or Python developers would use to access or upload data into Pandas data object. To learn more about Pandas, stay tuned. Hey guys, and welcome to the fourth lesson in our introduction to Pandas series. So in the previous lesson, we learned about all the different methods and techniques to get data from and into a pandas data object. We managed to upload external data sources into our pandas data frame and series objects. So the next natural step after you have your data set in a pandas data frame is to start exploring this data. So in this lesson, we will learn about all the different commands, functions, and procedures you can use in order to describe the information in your data frame. We will also learn about all the different built-in data types supported by the Pandas library. So let us quickly move to lesson number four. Once you have your data uploaded into a Pandas data frame, Data professionals usually have some typical questions that they need to answer about their data. For example, they want to know the size of their data set, what are the different data types they have, is there any missing values they need to deal with, and some basic summary statistics. All this investigation is really needed to identify what kind of data preparation they need to do in order to make the data set ready for further analysis. So let us start to import the data set that we have online. This data set is about alcohol consumption. And we already learned before about the use of the head function to display some of the top records in our data set. Okay, so we have this data set and we are displaying the top five records in this data set. A very natural question you may have when working with a new dataset is to ask what is the size of this dataset. For example, you want to know how many rows and columns do you have in this data frame. So to answer this question, we can use the shape attribute, which is a built-in attribute that can help you to answer this question. It will give you a Python tuple where the first value represents the number of records or rows, and the second value represents the number of columns. So let's try to write a code to use the shape on our alcohol dataset. The result number tells us that we have 193 records in five different columns. 
But it doesn't tell us other useful information, such as the number of these columns and their data types. Another commonly used attribute is the size attribute, which usually tells us how many elements or how many cells are there in our dataset. So let's also apply that. And we can see here that we have 965 cells in our data frame. So this comes from basically multiplying the number of records, which is 193, times the number of columns, 5, and you will get the 965. But keep in mind, this number represents all the cells, so everything, with and without missing values. And also you can use this attribute to display how many cells are there in a specific column or feature in our dataset. So let's say we want to know how many elements are there in the country name column. And we see we have 193 elements or cells in our country name column. Both of the commands shape and size give us basic information about the dimension of our data frame. Let's now try to get more details about our data frame. One of the most useful commands that you can use is the info attribute which is another attribute that you can apply on a data frame, but will give you much more information about your data set. So let's try to do that. And we can see here, they gave us a lot of useful information. We noticed the info attribute first gave us the number of entries or number of records that are there available in our data set, which are basically 193. And this is the number that is consistent with what the shape command told us. It also tells us the range index value, which is a numerical range value that the pandas library will automatically assign to each record. We haven't actually learned a lot about these index values yet, but later in this course, we will use these numerical range values to actually slice and dice our data. Next, it also tells us about the number of columns, and it seems that we have five different columns in our data set. And then there is this nice table showing us different column details. So we have the column number, column names, such as the country name, the beer serving, total liters, and also there is some information about the number of not null or missing values. So these are the number of cells that actually have values. And you can use this number to actually tell whether you have some missing values in your data frame or not. And what is the size of these missing values? In this particular data frame, it seems that all columns have values, so there are no missing values. And we can see that because we have 193 records and none of them have any null values. Finally, it shows the column data type, and there are several data types that Pandas library support. Some of them are text, some are numerical, and some are date values. And it's usually very important to have the correct data type for each column in your data frame. Again, later in this course, we will learn about the different data types and how we can actually update or change them. Finally, there are some details about how many columns in each data type. So there is the data type float, integer and object, and then the memory size, like how much memory is needed to upload this data frame. So we see how the info attribute actually gave us a lot of useful information about each column in our data set. Now let's move to a more advanced explicit analysis, and specifically we talk about the attribute describe. The describe attribute gives us statistical summary about our data set. For example, we notice there are some numerical columns in our dataset. And this attribute would tell us some statistical information about these columns. You can see here the function was applied to all the numerical columns, such as the beer serving and spirit serving and the wine serving and also the total liter of alcohol served and generated some standard statistical numbers, like the count or basically the number of cells that are available in each column, the mean and the standard deviation, the minimum and maximum values, and the different percentile values for each column. 
This summary statistic can be very useful if you want to quickly have a high level understanding about your data set, which is typically a very standard exploratory analysis process. So this summary was mainly for the numerical values in your data set, but we can also have non-numerical columns such as free takes and categories. Maybe you want to know the number of unique feature values and how many different values are there. So let's try to apply that. And to do that, we will make use of our country's data set. And let's display it to have the feel about this data set. We can see this data set has a lot of columns. So let's apply the unique function on the column called region name. Okay, so the result tells us that there are actually only this small list of unique values in the column region name. So we have the Americas, Oceania, Africa, Europe, Asia, and none, which means basically there are some null or missing values in this data set. Now, if we want to know how many unique values for each one of these regions, we can apply another pandas function called value counts. Cool, and that one will give us how many different values are there for each one of these unique region names. So in this lesson, we learned about some quick commands that help you to investigate your data set, like finding the size of your data frame and descriptive information about each column, the number of missing values, high level statistical values, the number of unique values, and so on. Now that we know how to find all this basic information, let's try to understand the different data types that are supported by the Pandas library. So the Pandas library can support seven different data types, and it's really important for a data professional to understand the usability of each data type. And they should also be able to convert any data frame column from one data type to another, depending on the analysis needs. So the Pandas library provides a very rich number of functions that will help you to actually do this conversion. This link will give you a list of the different ways to convert a Pandas data type from one type to another. Later in this course, we will see a lot of these examples to convert Pandas column data types. But for now, this small table will give you some information about each Pandas data type. So in the last lesson, we will learn how to perform some common data cleaning tasks. So please stay tuned. Hey guys. So in the last lesson, we learned about the different built-in commands and function that can help us to describe our data frame and series objects. We also learned about the different data types that we can use to store and represent our data. All these functions and commands can help us to identify if there are any potential problems or fixes that we need to apply on our data frames before the data can be ready for further analysis. In this lesson, we will learn about the most common techniques that help us to do data cleaning and data processing on our data set before they can be ready for further analysis. So let us quickly start with lesson number six, data cleaning in Pandas. So data cleaning is actually one of the most common tasks for any data professional. Usually real life data sets come with a large number of issues and problems such as missing values, having the wrong data type, or maybe even bad formatting. That's why data professionals usually need to spend some time correcting these issues before the data set is ready for further analysis. Luckily, the Pandas library has a lot of built-in functions that can help us to fix these issues. So we will go through some of the most common issues that we need to do for data cleaning. To demonstrate that, we will use some dummy datasets about countries' information. 
We cleared that using a method that we already learned before by transferring Python dictionaries into a dataset. So by looking at this dataset, we notice a few issues that we need to take care of before we start our analysis. First, we notice that the roles for the country of New Zealand was repeated two times in our dataset. Also, we notice the column for the country area actually contained two values in square kilometers and square miles. This is not a typical presentation as any data cell needs to be a single value per column. Let us also move and examine our data set using the info function. The results help us to identify further issues. So we notice here that both the country area column and the independence date column are actually assigned the object data type. Obviously, this is not the correct data type to use for these columns. If we try to make a list of all the different issues we need to fix in our dataset, first we need to split the country area value into two columns. So we have both values for square kilometers and square miles. Second, we need to remove any non-numerical characters from all the values. Third, we need to change country area column and the independence date column to the correct data type then drop and remove any unwanted columns and records, and finally rename the column names to the correct names. So let's move through our list of fixes, and we start with the first item, which is splitting the country area. If you notice that in the column country area, the values for both square kilometers and square miles are stored on the same column and the square miles are represented within a parenthesis with an empty space between the two values. In order to fix this, we typically need them to be in two separate columns. So to do this, let's use a pandas built-in function called split to separate these values into two different columns as shown here. So the first part of our code on the left side of the equal sign actually creates two new columns on our data frame. The columns obviously here are square kilometers and square miles as you can see. Then on the right side of the equal sign, we first identify the column country area in kilometers and miles. And we apply the split function, which is one of the many string functions. Any time we need to handle a data as a string, we need to identify the column name, then we put a dot string, and then one of the many possible text functions. So you see in this case, we applied the split function, which basically will split the text into two different pieces. And one of the important parameters to pass in the string is the string that we will use to split the value. So because we notice there's always one space between the two values, we will use that empty space as our split criteria. The last parameter, the expand equal to, is what you use to split these values and assign them into two new columns at the same time. As a result, you will notice that the column, the country area, kilometer, and mile was split into two new columns, one for square kilometers and one for square miles. However, we still notice there are some extra things such as like parentheses and commas that need further cleaning. So now we move to the next item in our data cleaning process, which is basically to clean or replace any extra and unwanted strings. We noticed after creating the two new columns in the last section, which are the area square kilometers and square miles, that there are still some extra characters within these values, like parentheses and commas. 
We need to continue our work to clean up and remove these extra characters in order to convert these columns into the correct data type. To do that, we can use the pandas built-in function called replace, which can be used to replace any specific string character with something else. In our case, we will replace these extra non-numerical values like commas, dashes, parentheses, and so on with basically nothing. Let's just remove them. Let's see how we can do that with the replace function. So we apply the function to both the new columns and run the cell. The warning result here is not actually an error. It's basically just a warning about some future changes in the function that we need to be concerned with in the upcoming updates of a pandas library. We notice here that the built-in function replace actually can take two parameters. The first parameter here may look a little bit weird, but this is basically just a regular expression. It means all the non-numerical or anything that is not a number. And the second parameter is the new value that will be replaced with. So here we notice it's actually not a space, but just an empty value. So the replace function will basically remove the non-numerical string from that text. We can have a look at how this looked now. And we see the new values actually look a little bit different from what we did before. You see the values here include characters and parentheses, while the new values do not include them, and they look all clean and nice. By now, what we did is we actually converted this column, the country area kilometers and mile, into two new columns. And we further cleaned and replaced all non-numerical values and removed them. So we can now move to the next task, which is basically to change the column data types. Once we finish cleaning our data, like splitting the column into two separate values and removing all the extra characters, we need to finish this work by changing the number values into the correct data types. Currently, the data are presented as text values, and we need to change the country's area numbers into numerical values, and the country's independent date values into the date data type. To do that, the pandas library provides us with the built-in function called asType. Takes the name of the column and the new data type that need to be assigned as the parameter. So let's see an example about how we can apply this function. So you see here, guys, uh, the function takes a dictionary. And within that dictionary, the key values represent the actual column names, and the values represent the new data types that we want to use. We see for the new column about the country's area, we will assign them the data type integer, while the column independence date is assigned the data type date. So the code was run without any problem, which means the data type was correctly changed and reassigned. And now we can move to the next part, which is dropping any unwanted rows and columns. Removing duplicate rows and columns is another common task in any data processing project. So far in our example, we notice we have some cases of duplicate data, such as the record of the country of New Zealand, which was listed two times, and also we split the column of the country area into two new separate columns. The pandas library provides another built-in function called drop, which can be used to remove any unwanted records and columns. The drop function needs specifying the corresponding axis on which the action will be applied. The axis value zero will basically apply the action to the row level, while the axis value 1 will apply the action to the column level. 
So let's have a look at this code example to see how this function works. So we start with typing our data frame name and then type the name of the column we don't need anymore, which is the country area in our case. Then we pass the axis, which will tell us the function that we want to delete the entire column. And then the parameter in a place will make that change permanent. By the way, if you ignore the parameter in place, the execution of the drop uh, function will only occur during runtime, which means it will not be permanent. So in place is a parameter that will always make sure the changes are permanent. That's how you drop any unwanted column. If you want to do the same thing, but on the rows, we can do something like this. We noticed for the country of New Zealand, there are basically two records. So we specify the record number five from the index to indicate that we want to remove that record. And to make that change permanent, we assign the in-place parameter to true. We notice we successfully removed that column and we also removed the extra record of New Zealand. However, there is also another way to remove any unwanted records. So imagine if you actually have more than just one repeated record. So let's say you have 10 different repeated records. Instead of using the drop function multiple times, the pandas library also provides us with a very nice function called drop duplicates, which can be used to remove all duplicated rows at the same time. So let's do that. and run the cell, and we can see it was run successfully. This function will remove all the duplicate records in one line of code. So you guys see that these two functions, drop and drop duplicates, can be very useful for removing unwanted rows and columns. We notice now our country data frame is actually getting cleaner. We did a lot of changes, like we removed unnecessary or unwanted rows and columns, we changed the data type, and we split one column into two different columns. We still have one last thing to do. Sometimes data professionals need to change also the column name or the column title in their data frame columns. A common naming format is to have all the title names in small letters separated by an underscore. Luckily, the pandas library also provide us with a built-in function to do this task. And this function is basically called the rename function. So let's have a look at an example to see how this function can be used to rename our columns. First, we start to type the country data frame. And now we need to specify the old and the new column names in a Python dictionary object. So the current column name will be the keys and the values represent the new column names. Okay, so seems to be running successfully. Let's just go again and see how our data frame looks now using the info built-in function. It's look like we have successfully changed the column name and we have the correct data types, and we don't have any unnecessary or unwanted columns. And let us have a final look at our data frame now. And this is how it's currently looked like. So guys, in this lesson, we learned about some of the most commonly and widely used data cleaning tasks that any data professional will need to use in their daily work. Hey guys, and welcome to the sixth lesson in our Introduction to Pandas series. In the last lesson, we learned about the different built-in functions and techniques available in the Pandas library to perform data cleaning and manipulation. 
These techniques can help us to fix a lot of problems in real-life datasets, such as text formatting, choosing the correct data type, and so on. In this lesson, we will learn about another practical data manipulation technique, which is joining and merging multiple datasets. So let us move to lesson number seven, joining datasets in Pandas. Data professionals sometimes need to combine and manage multiple datasets to do their analysis projects. For example, let's say you are working on a project to analyze the impact of sport games on food and beverage sales. You will typically need different datasets such as game timetables, sport team performance, sport venues, as well as sales figure from different vendors. If you are using Python Pandas library as your main tool to collect these different datasets, it's likely that each dataset is stored as a different data frame. In order to create a large dataset or combine them together, the Pandas library provides different tools that will help you to do this task. In this lesson, we will learn about two main methods or built-in functions that help you to do that. The first method is the pandas concat function, which is a simple combination of two or more data frames in a column-wise or row-wise style. These combinations usually have less restriction about the joining condition. The second method is the pandas merge function, which allow for a complex column-wise combination similar to SQL query joining. So let us first start with the pandas concat function. To demonstrate how it works, we can create some dummy datasets about popular sport tournaments such as the FIFA World Cup and the Rugby World Cup. Each one of these datasets has different pieces of information and we will see how we can add them together. So let's start with the FIFA World Cup dataset. And let's also display the dataset. Okay, so we see here the dataset has three different columns, which represent the year of the tournament, the winning team, and the host country. And we also need to create the Rugby World Cup tournament dataset. And for this, the Rugby World Cup dataset, we see that it has different pieces of information. It has the same year, the winning team and host country, but also has the venue and the attendance size of the last game. So let's try to combine these two data frames and create one large data frame. Basically, we want to join the winning teams from the FIFA World Cup and the Rugby World Cup and only use these common columns between the two datasets. So let's have a look at the code to do that. We will need to create a new data frame and we can call it teams using the concat function. Here we notice that we combined the two data frames together. The one on top was the data frame of the FIFA World Cup and the second one represents the Rugby World Cup teams. We notice there are several issues with this new dataset. First, on the most left side, the new dataset actually combined the original index value from the FIFA World Cup and the Rugby World Cup datasets. The new index is basically just a combination of the two old index values. Therefore, it includes some repeated values. Another thing we also notice is that it is very hard to identify or distinguish which one of these records belong to the FIFA Soccer World Cup and which one belong to the Rugby World Cup. 
we start to fix these issues by changing some of the parameters in the concat function. We first try to fix the key issues by highlighting the source of the data frame. So we will be able to know which one of these records belong to the Rugby World Cup or the FIFA World Cup. So let's have a look and see how we can do that. We notice here we actually used the key parameters within the concat function to add another value that can help us to distinguish which record belong to the FIFA World Cup or the Rugby World Cup dataset. This parameter actually created something called multi-level index values, which is something we will be learning more about in the next lesson. In other scenarios, we may also want to have totally new numerical index values. So another parameter within the concat function is the option that allows us to ignore the original index values and replace them with the totally new values. So let's learn how we can do that. Here we see that the new data frame, EF teams, actually include a totally new index value with numbers that are between 0 to 11. And these values ignore the old index values. So in these examples, we have learned that the concat function can be used to combine multiple data sets on top of each other when they have the exact or similar column names or structures. But sometimes this may not be the case, and you want to add together some data frames without having the exact or same amount of columns or structures. This is also possible with the concat function. Let's have a look at how the results may look like. We will again do our DF teams data frame, but this time we will not specify the exact number of columns. We notice here how the original two datasets were added or combined together on top of each other. However, for the original Rugby World Cup data frame, it also included two extra columns, which are the venue and attendance size. We notice these values were not originally available in the FIFA World Cup dataset. That's why it will be added with the missing values and only the value from the Rugby World Cup dataset will be available. This type of joining tables on top of each other is what is known as the column axis. If you remember, we also learned before that we have the option to assign which axis a pandas function can be applied to. The axis parameter of the concat function can be changed to allow the dataset columns to be added on top or next to each other. So let's have a look and see how this can be implemented. Okay, and you see here how the datasets were added next to each other. The first few columns, such as the year, winner, and host country, belong to the FIFA World Cup dataset, while the last five columns, such as year, winner, host country, venue, and attendance size, belong to the Rugby World Cup dataset. So we learned that the concat function has the flexibility to do different ways of merging datasets whether on top of each other or next to each other. 
It also allows us to highlight the original source data frame or not, and whether you want to keep the original index value or replace them with a new value. These were some of the most common use cases of the pandas concat function, and you see how it can be a very flexible and useful tool. Now moving to the merge function, which is another built-in tool of pandas library that helps us to join multiple datasets in a similar way to a relational database operation. So people who are already familiar with SQL may find some similarities about how this function works and how the joining operation in SQL can happen. You will notice that there is a focus on the use of key values and how similar values on both datasets can help to decide how to merge the dataset. So as usual, we need to have some dummy datasets to practice with. In this example, we will create two datasets, and these datasets have some similar values in their columns called keys, and also have some different columns too. Let's have a look at the code. The cell was run successfully. So let's have a look at our new datasets. We start with the left dataset. And the right dataset. Okay. We notice the two datasets have different columns, A, B, C, and D, which belong to different data frames. However, there is one common column called keys. This is the same column name in both datasets. And inside that column, there are some similar values in both datasets, such as K0 and K1, as well as some different values, such as K4 and K5, that only available in the left datasets, and K6 that is only available in the right dataset. Similar to SQL operations, the merge function can take some parameters that can simulate the SQL environment. For example, if you have a common column that appears on both data frames, you can specify that column using the on parameter. Also, if there are some columns names, but you have similar values appear on both data frames within different names, you can identify that using the left on and right on parameters. The left on will be the first dataset and right on is the second dataset. The parameter indicator is something very similar to what we used before to show us the source of the original data frame. And finally, the parameter how is similar to a SQL joining operation, which can be like the inner join, left join, right join, and outer join. Let's have a look at the first example. In this example, we will join the data frames using the parameter default values, which is basically the inner join operation. And we will notice only the values that appear on both data sets are selected. So this is the name of our new data set. And here we decide the left and right data sets. And we display the data sets. And we notice that only four rows were selected. These are the records within the key values K0, K1, K2, and K3, and originally appear on both the left and right data sets. This is essentially how the SQL inner join usually works. We also notice how the indicator parameter gives us the source of the record. That means these four records appear on both sides of the joining table. Now let's try to change the how parameter from the default inner join to outer join to see what's the difference. And we can check if we can get the all the records in our datasets.
Okay, here we see we joined both the common and non-common columns of the records. The records with K0 to K3 appear to be common on both the original datasets, while K4 and K5 records appear only from the left dataset and doesn't have any values for columns C and D, while K6 appears to be from the right dataset and doesn't have any values for column A and B. Now you can try to practice some of these parameters on your own and see if you can change the indicator from true to false and other joining options to see how this merge function can work. So these two functions, merge and concat, represent some of the most commonly used methods to join datasets in a pandas library. In the next lesson, we will learn about how to access and aggregate data using pandas library. So keep watching. Hey guys, and welcome to the seventh lesson in our introduction to Pandas series. So far in this course, we have learned about all the different techniques and built-in functions available in Pandas library to help data professionals to upload and clean external datasets in order to get them ready for further analysis. In this lesson, we will learn about all the different tools that allow data professionals to query and explore their data frames. So let us move to lesson number eight, data accessing and aggregation. Once you get your data frame clean and ready for analysis, you can start to perform some tasks such as selecting rows and columns. And of course, there are multiple ways to do that. For example, select by row and by the index value. You can also add filters and conditions to only select specific rows or subsets of rows based on certain conditions. And you can also do data aggregation and sorting. To demonstrate all these examples, we will again need to use a toy dataset. So let us build one about countries information. This dataset has several values about region, population size, language, and so on. Let us start writing the code for our dataset and we will call it the country's information. And we display the data frame. We notice in this dataset we have information about 25 different countries, where each country has some numerical values, such as its population, and some text values like the main language, region, and name. Also notice that we replace the default numerical index with a predefined index value called the ISO code, which is basically a two-letter code representing the country name. So let us use this dataset to learn about all the different ways that we can use to select records from a pandas data frame. The pandas library provides multiple ways to select specific rows and columns. In this example, we will learn about two main functions to do that, loc lock and iloc iloc. The lock function is basically a label-based selection function, which means it allows you to select a list of records by specifying their label name or their index value. While the iLock is a similar function, but allow you to select a list of records by supplying their numerical index value. Let's see some example by selecting the record for the country China. We will do it in two ways. One way to select that is to use the lock function. And the other way is to use the iLock function. So we select the record we want. Uh, CN or China using the lock function, and then we do the same thing using the iLock function. So notice how these two examples will actually give you the same result, and in one way we select the index name, and the other way we select the index integer. So if we come back here and we start counting 0, 1, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way to 10 and China. So always remember to start counting from zero. The record has CN as the index label and number 10 as its integer value. Similarly, you can pass a list of labels or list of index values. This time I pass a list of countries. So we select China again, and New Zealand, and the UK. So one limitation of this approach is that users need to know the exact position or the index label for that record they want to select. In another scenario, you may not know the exact name or position for the records you need, but you want to select a range of values or several records at the same time. Like you want to select from this index value to another index value. We can do that using lock and iLock as we can see in this example. This command will give us another subset where the country of China is the first country and the country of New Zealand is the last country. We can actually achieve the same output using the iLock function by identifying the range from numerical positions 10 to a position 23. This will give us the same result where China is the first country and New Zealand is the last country. So these examples showed us how we can use the lock and iLock function to select data frame records using the index label or the numerical index value. What you can also do is to specify which column you want to display. And again, you can do that using the column label or its numerical index. So let us modify this example to also select specific column names. OK, and here we can specify a list of column names. From the result, we notice that we selected the same range of records from the country China to the country of New Zealand, but we only use a specific list of column names. This same output can be repeated using the iLock function. And we see here it gives us the same result as in the range and selected number of columns, based on rows and columns numerical index values. One last thing to notice is sometimes you can skip Totally skip the use of lock and iLock function if you want to select the entire dataset or the specific columns of your data frame. Let's have a look at this example. This time I want to select specific columns, say region and population. So this will return the entire data frame values for the selected columns. So far, we have learned how to select subset of our data frames by identifying the needed index values, either using the index name or the index numerical value. Sometimes you may want to do something a little bit more advanced, like you may want to select your records based some on condition, such as a numerical condition, a date condition, or a text condition. We will learn how to do that. We will apply these conditions by using the lock and iLock functions. We can specify each individual condition with a parenthesis, and we can also add a list of conditions. And these conditions need to be joined together using the AND or the OR operators. Let's have a look at an example by selecting all the countries that have their main language is English.
Now I want to specify that condition where the main language is only English, so we will need to pass that as a parenthesis. We see here in this example, we first identified our data frame name and we used the lock function. Since we didn't specify any record label, then this query would select all the records that match the condition where the country main language is English. So you can see here that these countries are actually in multiple regions. Some of them are in Africa, North America, Europe, and Oceania. So let's say we want to add another filter or another condition. Say you want to have the English as the main language and the region is Oceania. So we can modify this query by having the AND operator to specify as another condition. Now we further limit our subset to be based on these two conditions. Notice the structure of all conditions. We say that each condition needs to be within one parenthesis, and we notice that within that parenthesis, we need to specify the data frame name and the column name, and then specify the condition value. So if you want it to be the exact match, then use the double equal sign. And if the condition is on the numerical value, like the population, we can use other comparison operators, such as the more than, more than equal, less than, less than equal and we have to place that condition on the right side. So since in this example, we need to filter based on both conditions, so we need to make sure both conditions are actually true. Condition number one is about the language and condition number two is about the region. Then we need to join these two conditions with the AND operator. If only one of them need to be true, not both of them, we can replace that with the all operator, so the whole operation will look like this. When we run the code, we see there are different results because it's either matching the Oceania region or it's matching the English language condition. Coming up next, we will learn about another way to sort our results. So far, we have learned about how to apply multiple conditions to select specific subsets. Let's take a look at the example we did and try to sort our data. For this example, let us try to apply a sorting methodology. To do that, the pandas library provides us with a built-in function called sort values, and this function can take multiple parameters. And one of the main parameters you need to specify is the sorting column. If the sorting column was a numerical one, then it can be sorted from the smallest value to the largest value, or the other way around. If it's a date column, then it can be sorted from the earliest to the latest, and if it's a text column, it can be sorted alphabetically. The sort value functions can be attached to any query. So you can do that here, say sort values, and let's sort the results by the column population. And you can see here, the results are displayed in ascending order based on the population column. Now you guys can try to have a look at all the different parameters for this sort function and see what parameters you can use to make the result in descending order. Also keep in mind that the sort values function can be applied either to a query like the example above or to the entire data frame. For example, if we put sort values after the data frame name, This will give us the entire data frame sorted by a population column. Finally, in this lesson, we will learn about another technique which shows us how we can calculate a numerical value that is assigned to a specific group of records. For example, sometimes you want to do a sum up, say the total population or, or the average population per group of records. In order to do that, the Pandas library provides us with a group by function which can be used to target a specific group of records. 
and calculate a summary value for that group. So let us try to do that and make a query to summarize the total population size per main language. So we add the group by function after the data frame name, and we need to specify the grouping column. In this case, it's the main language. And also the numerical summary column. In this case, it's the population size. We notice here the result gives us the total number of population size per the language group. So that was easy. Now, if we want to do the same thing, but this time we want to calculate the population size per region, And as you can see here, this example will give us the total sum of population per region. So in this lesson, we learned about all the different techniques that allow us to explore and query data from our data frames. We learned how to select a subset of record based on their index values or column name, and how to add one or multiple conditions to filter results and how to sort these results based on specific column names, and how to group them together using the group by function. In the next lesson, we will learn about applying data visualization techniques using the Pandas library. So keep watching. Hey guys, and welcome to another lesson in our introduction to Pandas series. So in the last lesson, we learned about all the different tools and techniques available in Pandas library to help us explore our data. We learned how you can select specific rows and columns and how you can add filters and conditions to select specific subsets of your data. And also what functions you can use to sort and aggregate your data frame. In this lesson, we will be moving to another type of explanatory data analysis, which is more focused on data visualization. So let's check our lesson number nine. We start to talk about how you can visualize your data in Pandas. As you guys know, data visualization is an important aspect of every explanatory data analysis. It helps data analysts to summarize a very large amount of data using visual elements that provide you with a better understanding of your dataset. But although the Pandas library is not specifically designed to be a data visualization tool, it has some very powerful and useful tools to quickly create clear and cool visualization elements. In this lesson, we will focus on two types of data visualization. First one is creating graphs such as histogram, pie chart, time series, box plots, and so on. And second one, we will focus on table visualization, which is basically using the some sort of HTML and styling option to highlight specific parts of your data frame based on a predefined condition. So the main tool we will focus on for data visualization is the plot method, which can be applied to a Panda series or data frame object. This method has a lot of built-in parameters. And to learn more about all these parameters in the plot function, we can click on the plot function link documentation page. Here we can see all the different parameters that we can use in this lesson. For example, we will need to identify the name of the data frame, the X and Y variable, and most importantly, the kind parameter which has a lot of different types of plots to display different types of visualization. And also there are so many other parameters. So let us start to learn how to create some popular data visualization graphs. Our first plot is called the time series graph. Time series graphs are a very popular visualization method to show how any value moves through time. We can see this graph applied a lot in financial market data or to track the price movements such as oil price or gold price and so on. So let us start to use an example about visualization time series data representing the size of air travel passenger datasets through the year. We will download this dataset from GitHub using this code.
and we can visualize this data set to see how it looks like. We notice in this data set we have two columns. The first column represents the date, which is basically one month interval starting from 1949 forward. The other column represents the number of passengers aggregated by thousands. In order to make use of this data frame to make time series plot, we need to do a little bit of data manipulation. Basically, we need to move the month column to be our index value. If you remember how we can do that, we can make it as an index using the setIndex function. Okay, so now the column month was assigned as the index value. We can have a look at the data frame and see how it looks like. And we see the month column was moved to be the index value. So now we can start to plot this data frame. Notice how we use the plot function using default options and without adding any parameters. So the function generated this time series plot or what is known as the line chart, which is the default behavior of the plot function. But let us try to change the size of this plot using the figure size parameter, which take the height and width in inches. So we select the size we want and run the cell to make the figure look like a little bit bigger. This example shows you how easy it is to actually apply the plot function once you have your data frame ready and all data are in the correct shape. Another common data visualization scenario for data analysts is to explore the relationship between two different variables to see if there are any kind of positive or negative relationship or if they have any impact on each other. The most common type of visualization is something called a scatter plot, and this scatter plot helps us to visualize this type of relationship. So in this example, we will use a dataset called Iris dataset. This dataset is basically about three different types of flowers, and we will try to explore the relationship between some variables in this dataset. Let's have a look. After we display the data, we notice there are five different columns. Four of them are numerical values, or sepal length and width, petal length and width, and the last column represents the species of the flower. Okay, let's try to explore the relationship between two of these variables using a scatter plot. And we need to assign a few parameters for the plot function to make the visualization. The first parameter is kind, which basically is to identify the figure as the scatter plot. And then it's need to identify the values that represent the x and y axes. And finally, we add the size of the figure. So we run this cell and we notice here there are some sort of positive relationship between the two variables. The higher each value, the other value will go also higher. The scatter plot usually can give a lot of useful information to a data analyst about the relationship between the variables. What data professionals usually do is to apply some sort of coloring scheme to highlight different data dimensions. So here we have variables based on the x and y axes, and by using different colors for different values, the plot function can give us another dimension and depth to our data visualization. So let's try to do that. How about we color different groups of dots based on their species value? 
To do that, we can again change the parameter in our plot function to specify these color values. Let us first create some sort of a coloring scheme. In this example, we basically assign a color value to represent each flower species value type. In other words, we tell the parameters that the species Satosa has the blue color, the Versa color has the red, and the Virginica has the yellow color. And now, let's apply that color scheme as a parameter to our plot function. You see here we actually use a different parameter, the parameter C, which is used to interpret the color scheme that we created earlier. We now run the cell, and we see here our changes replace each flower species with its corresponding color scheme. This flexibility already gives the data analyst a much more depth and information and understanding about their data. So here we have learned how the pandas built-in plot function can be used to explore and change so many different types of data visualization. Another thing we can also do with the pandas library is actually to apply some sort of coloring and styling within our data frame objects. What we can do here, for example, as you display your dataset in a data frame object, you apply some sort of coloring and styling setting to this data frame. Let's have a look at this example. So this code here should look very familiar. We basically sorted our data frame based on a specific value. In this case, it's the sepal width. What we can do now is to add some sort of styling on this data frame. We see in this code we added the styling option, which is basically you add some sort of CSS element if you are already familiar with the HTML development. It's basically adding a bar chart on the variable sepal width. So let's run the cell. We see here it actually just added a bar chart to visualize how the values are moving for sepal width. And remember, this can actually be added to any data frame. So in this lesson, we learned about two main techniques that are available in Pandas library to help users visualize data, either as a graph, such as pie chart, bar chart, time series chart, or scatter plot, or as a coloring style inside a data frame object. In the next lesson, we will get a chance to apply everything we learned so far in this crash course on a project that involves collecting and analyzing real life data set. So please stay tuned. Hey guys, and welcome to the last lesson in our introduction to Panda series. So far in this course, we learned about how to start using the Python data analysis library Pandas. We covered different topics, including how to get data into and from Pandas data object, data cleaning and joining, data visualization, and many more topics. So in this final lesson, we will have a data project to allow you to practice the use of Pandas library in a real life scenario. To learn more details about this task, let us click on lesson number 10, Pandas Analysis Project. So I'm sure you guys are aware about the huge impact of COVID-19 outbreak on our lives since the beginning of the pandemic in late 2019. I'm recording this video in January 2022, and we are still dealing with a lot of lockdowns and travel restrictions. 
Since the beginning of this outbreak, many datasets have emerged trying to show us the impact of this pandemic on every aspect of our life, like from the economy, social activities, working pattern, travel, and so on. In this project, we are collecting some free and publicly available datasets to put them together and try to understand the impact of COVID-19 outbreak on your country and community. So to do that, we will make use of the following two datasets. First is the Google Community Mobility Reports, which are the free datasets provided by Google to help us understand how people movement behavior have changed at different places, such as the workplace, outdoor parks, public transportation, and so on. The second dataset is the COVID-19 confirmed cases dataset provided by Our World in Data and contain a lot of frequently updated details like total and daily cases, vaccination rate, availability of intensive care unit, and so on. So let's try to collect these datasets and see what kind of insights we can find about the response and the impact of COVID outbreak in your local city, community, and country. As usual with any analysis project, we start the work by accessing the datasets. We will first get the Global Mobility Report dataset by downloading the CSV file from the website and saving it into our local computer. So we did that and saved the file in our local dataset folder. As you can see here, this is the same folder we used earlier in the course to save other datasets. So all we need now is to read this dataset as a pandas data frame. Now for the second dataset of daily COVID cases, the file is actually updated daily and uploaded to a GitHub repo. So there's no need for us to download a local copy as we can access the data directly from the GitHub repo. Okay, so we run this cell and this may take a little time uh, for the data to be downloaded completely. All right. So it seems the data was downloaded correctly, but we have some warning about possible issues with the data type. This is not actually an error, but the COVID cases dataset is actually a very big file and for some of the values may have some issues with the data type. So let us start to explore these data frames and see if we can discover anything useful. We start with the mobility report dataset. We use the info function to give us a nice summary about this dataset. And we show the top few records of the data frame using the head function. We learned about both of these functions in a previous lesson. So we see here that the mobility report data frame has more than 7 million entries and about 15 different columns. The dataset contains columns about the geographic locations, collection date, and multiple numerical values about the reported mobility activities. And this is how the datasets look like. We see some records about location like place ID and of course collection date values. So let us do the same process for the COVID cases dataset. Okay, so we see for this dataset we have about 130,000 entries as of now, and this number keeps growing every day. We also see columns about location, dates, total number of cases, and so many other useful information, like the number of deaths as a total and as the percentage to the population of the country. And we also have information about the availability of ICU units, hospitalization rate, test and vaccination figures. So it's actually a very rich data set and this is how it's looked like. So in order to use these two data sets to try to understand the impact, let's pick up a location where we can see how the impact happened in a given area or a country. We will use the country of New Zealand to demonstrate this process. But for you guys, feel free to change that to your local country or a place you may be interested in. From examining the two datasets, we notice that they both have some sort of a date element. 
So in order to watch how the impact of the art to play developed through time, we learned that one of the best thing to do is to use the time series visualization. We also learned that in order for the time series visualization using Pandas library to work, it is a good practice to assign the date value as our index value. This will help the plot function to show the time or date column as the x-axis. So let us try to do that for both datasets. So in this code cell, we updated the default index value for both datasets to the date column using the setIndex function. Notice how we make use of the inPlace parameter within the setIndex function to make sure the changes are permanent. So we hit Ctrl Enter and see that the cell did run successfully. So that's all good. Let us now go ahead and try to visualize the impact of COVID outbreak in the country of New Zealand. So to do that, we will use the COVID cases dataset and we try to find whatever column in that dataset to use as a filter. Let's say we only want records from the country of New Zealand and we are only interested in the new daily cases as we can see in this command. So we see for this query, what we did is we first identify the data frame name, which is the COVID cases, and then we applied the condition to limit us to a subset of the record to filter only the country of New Zealand. And from that subset, we added another filter to say that we only interested in a new COVID cases. Once we have that, then we apply the plot method that we learned about in the last lesson. Notice how we didn't specify the plot kind, so the function applied the default behavior and generated a line chart or what's called the time series chart. Also note the use of the figure size parameter to identify the figure size. So we see here from the visual representation, the first initial spike in COVID cases in the early 2020. Then for the most part of 2020 and 2021, there was almost very low number of cases until around August 2021, where we noticed there was a new outbreak or spike, and that spike continued to grow as we moved toward the end of that year. So you can easily now change the ISO code value for your home country or the country that you are interested in and watch how the outbreak timeline changed in that community. So that's what we see from the actual cases. Now, what do you think will be the impact of case number on daily life activities such as people movement and traffic behavior? That's what we can see from the mobility report dataset. So let us try to investigate that for the same country or area during the same time period we used above. And here we will need to add similar filters to limit the location and movement pattern we need. Okay, so in this code, what we did is we used the mobility report data frame to filter 
to a specific subset or a specific country. So here we limited our query to the country of New Zealand, and because for this country there are no subregion values, so we added the condition for the subregion value to be null. And from that dataset, we use two different columns. The first column is the workspace traffic percentage change and the outdoor parks traffic percentage change. So these patterns represent how people movement behavior has changed from the usual pattern prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. So what we notice here is that at the beginning of the pandemic during 2020, we see a big drop where the country moved into a major lockdown and most people had to stay and work from home. So we see that both workspace and outdoor park areas have lower than usual traffic pattern. And then as lockdown restrictions started to be lifted, people started to slowly go back to work from office again and also enjoy visiting outdoor parks. And for the majority of time in 2020 and most of 2021, Movement patterns were very normal, until we noticed that same big spike here in August 2021. And we see the same drop in people mobility again as people had to stay at home again. And as the section started to be lifted again, we see things go back to normal. We also notice there are some interesting spikes like here around the Christmas time. So I will leave this for you guys to try to guess and figure out what could be the cause for these spikes. Think about what would be some external event that will change people movement behavior. So things like holidays and extreme weather events and so on. So you can clearly see this big spike around Christmas time where there is so much activity at parks and outdoor areas but very little activities around workplace. So I will leave you guys to see what kind of other datasets you may need to import and add to your analysis to understand these spikes. So this was a small project that we needed to collect two datasets and try to filter and apply some conditions to analyze the behavior of COVID-19 pandemic on people movement and travel behavior. Obviously, there are so many other things you can do using the Pandas library. And we hope in this course, we give you all the essential things to start using Pandas library in your work. For more information about any of the built-in methods and function we learned in this course, you can see more details at the Pandas library official documentation page. Thanks a lot guys for watching.